How much time do we need to attain Nibbana? Hmm? One chitta. So this is one and a half hours too long, right? Excellent. Well then, let's conclude by transferring the merits. I mean, you've observed the precepts, haven't you? And that's enough. That's all the Dhamma you need. If you've done your Buddha and Sarnan, Dhamma and Sarnan and Sangang Sarnan. And if you've understood the profoundness in those words, hmm? and how the Dhamma is contained within each syllable of the precepts, the, the, simply the precepts that you observe, then you're now equipped with all the Dhamma that you need to attain Nibbana. So today is a very special day. And I was thinking about how fortunate we all are to have the Buddha Sasana. And I want to talk to you about that because with everything that's going on out there, you know, all the preparations to pay tribute to our fallen heroes and members of the armed forces to whom we transfer merits at the end of every sermon, as we have been doing right from the start, as well as members of the police force and so on. On this special occasion that is today, with the proceedings that are going on today, it really gives us food for thought as to how unique and how special the Sambuddha Sasana is. And I want to explain that to you by taking into account what we are about to do here today. So I know I'm going to get carried away when we start with that. So before that, let us all take a moment first to bring our palms together in veneration of the Supreme Enlightened One, the Perfect One, the Magnificent One. It is because of Him today we have the Buddha Sasana. And as we do so, let us also remind ourselves how fortunate each and every one of us are to be in the presence of the Noble Triple Gem and to have this opportunity to redeem ourselves from all the karma that we've done in the past and to free ourselves from the bondage of Raga, Desha and Moha and to attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa if you've been in a relationship at any point in your life, which most of us have at some point or the other, say that in a love relationship, maybe a girlfriend, boyfriend, you just have a crush initially, then you get into an affair, right? These are moments, yeah, crushed, yes. These are moments where you feel like you have to appreciate the other person for what they do for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's quite, quite fine and quite all right, and as we should. See, one of the things that we do when we want to show appreciation to another human being is we give them gifts, don't we? Now, what might one give to someone that they like, maybe a crush or an affair that someone that has an affair with? What sort of thing might they give as a gift? Flowers, yeah, that's the first thing that comes to mind for most people. Maybe a box of chocolates. Maybe a bottle of water. <laughs> Why <are> you laugh? <laughs> Take them out for a movie. Hmm? Maybe invite them around for, for a meal. <coughs> See, we give these gi things as gifts because we want to show them the appreciation that we have for them. Appreciation for what, though, is what I want you to think for a second. We show them appreciation for fulfilling a part or a requirement that we have, a need that we have. They fulfill that need. Now, where 
someone you have an affection for, and I'm not talking about parents, siblings, I'm not talking about that sort of affection, I'm talking about the affection that you might have towards a member of the other gender, right? So something that might lead on to love, maybe to you, the two of you living together, right? That sort of relationship. Typically, one of the needs that are fulfilled is a sensual need. I deliberately use the word sensual, okay? Because sensuality includes everything. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body, and the rest of it. So, for someone who satisfies these sensual needs, we feel the need to appreciate in return, and then we give them a bouquet of flowers, maybe a box of chocolates, maybe you know, a card, right? And all these things. So, these are things that we give to someone who we appreciate, because they satisfy some of our needs. Maybe some of those needs are needs that are very, very important to us. They are part of our vexation. If you had a set of vexations, these are part, they, they satisfy part of our vexations. Now then, there are some people who go even further. You know, maybe a, bo a box of chocolates, maybe a bouquet of flowers doesn't seem enough, and perhaps they might go even further and maybe buy them something expensive. Like what? Yes, there you go. Maybe a, a branded watch, maybe some other accessory, maybe some nice clothes, maybe even a house, hmm? maybe an island. Or they might even build for them a mahal and later call it the Taj Mahal. All in the name of love. Because these are things that people give as a token of appreciation to someone because they satisfy needs that they have. Remember what they satisfy. They satisfy sensual needs. Now think about what we're doing here today. Today, you'll be seeing many faces, and many of them will be in uniform. These are men and women who have saved, or served our nation rather, and they have sacrificed their lives to protect that of another. Now there's always another side to, another side to war. Right? We always talk about how they have saved our lives, but you have to remember that there's always another side to the coin. In saving one life, they've had to take away another. So at the end of the day, there are no winners in this. And that also I'll explain to you in a moment. There's never a winner in war. There can't be. If it is so, then the principle of cause and effect cannot be true. If one is true, then there being a winner in war cannot be true. They are mutually exclusive phenomena. And I'll come to that in a moment. I'm talking about what we are doing here today. If we are willing to give something expensive as a gift, maybe a car, maybe a house, maybe an island, maybe build for them a, a palace, and spare any cost to show our appreciation for someone who is prepared to go the extra mile to satisfy our sensual needs, I ask you this question, what do you think is deserved by someone who has sacrificed their lives on our behalf. I'll name a few things, and if you think that is sufficient, then nod your head in agreement. So, once again, to someone who satisfies our sensual needs, we give a bouquet of flowers. How about for someone who sacrifices their life on our behalf? What shall we give them? A bouquet of flowers? No, one is not enough, so we have to give them two. Am I right? Not one bunch of flowers, we give them two bunches of flowers. For someone who has sacrificed their life on our behalf. No, not enough? Okay then. A box of chocolates for someone who satisfies our sensual needs, someone who pleases the eye, someone who pleases the ear, someone who satisfies our tongue, someone who satisfies our, satisfies our nose, someone who satisfies our physical needs. We give them a box of chocolates. What shall we give for the people who have sacrificed their lives to save ours? Two boxes of... Come on. 
chocolates. Yes? Well then, let's build a house for them, shall we? Let's build a house for them. Would that do? If we built a house for them? What if we buy them a car? Let's buy them the most expensive car. Someone who's willing to lay their life on the line on our behalf. Someone who's willing to give us everything they have. I mean, you know, a life encompasses everything you have, right? Remember last week or the week before I was talking to you about the sasana? Is there a point in the sasana existing for, the another, for another two and a half thousand years if yours and my life will, will end in another twenty? Then what good is the two and a half thousand years? Of no use to us. Because once we've given our life up, then we've given pretty much everything up. So everything as we know it today will cease to exist the moment your eyes shut for the last time. So if someone's willing to sacrifice their life on your behalf, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you this question. What is it that they deserve in appreciation of that? Have a think about this. What should we give them as a tribute? Shall we give them a plot of land? Wait, in Colombo 7? Hmm? The priciest part of the land, of the country? Ten acres of coconut? What shall we give them in appreciation? What shall we give them as a tribute for laying their lives down to save ourselves so that you and I can today be here? Perhaps the reason you and I are still here is because one of them one day diffused a bomb that was about to go off. The other day I was listening to one of our Anagarika Mahatmya, she was giving a talk and she was saying, Swami Nansa, I'm so delighted that we are doing this program because I've always wanted to pay tribute to the armed forces because one of those days, I remember she said, when I was younger, I was prepared, I was at that age where I was going for, going to, I was in my, having my, taking my education and then one day I was about to get onto a bus and then some or other, I missed the bus and then I got on the next bus and then what do you know, later that night I got to hear that, that, a, that a bomb had gone off in the bus that I missed. And then she said, this is how they have saved my life. Now you might wonder, how is it that they saved her life because she was just lucky to get into the next bus. So what did the armed forces do to save her life because the previous bomb went off? Well, that's because you're only thinking about the bomb that went off. You're not thinking about the bomb that got diffused, which was in the next bus. Yeah? It was because that bomb got diffused that when she got onto that bus, another life was saved. Perhaps, maybe a hundred lives were destroyed in the previous one, but that was just the one that got away. So it's quite possible, ladies and gentlemen, because I myself, we have traveled in buses plenty. Guru Amdur Nuhansi has traveled in buses plenty and trains, right? you and I, we've all been there. So perhaps this is a very chance meeting. The probability of us meeting here like this, perhaps is very much down to someone putting their life on, line, on the line to save ours. So again, I ask you the question, what should we give them as a tribute for that sacrifice? What material thing do you think will tick the box and say, yep, that's it, that's the right price? Have they given us something that they could take back. Think about it for a second. As a soldier takes their weapon and goes onto the battlefield to battle on our behalf, are they laying down something that if taken from them, they can earn back? Are they? No. You know what I mean, right? Because when they're there, they're prepared to give their life up not something they can take back if lost. Don't you think then they deserve something equally precious? Something that cannot be taken back from them once given? A house. I'm not undermining any of this. You know, our fallen heroes and their families, you know, people who have fought this war on behalf of whoever. And I mean both sides. If someone is willing to sacrifice their lives for someone else, right? If they feel it's for a just cause, whether the other party agrees or not, if they feel it is for a just cause, I've got to be careful here, because these are hot waters. 
right? Some people might agree with me. Perhaps the majority will disagree with me. So I have to be careful here. Because you see, the way you and I see the world is now different to how most other people see the world. Because they think friends and enemies. We see ailing hearts and broken minds that need to be healed, that need to be fixed. You know, in the game of war, there's never a victor. They're all losers. And we are only, we are only able to see this because we have begun to see the world through the lens of the Dhamma, right? So if someone's willing to lay down something that they know that they can never get back if lost, what is the price of that sacrifice? What is it that you can give them that you think is a fitting tribute for that sacrifice? Is it a house? Is it a car? Is it some land? Or perhaps if, what, if we can, what if we can take on the cost of teaching, educating, Three generations of their families will send them all abroad and so that they can have a good education. Do you think that fits the bill? No, because what are they prepared to sacrifice? Something that they cannot get back if they lose it. Now then answer this question for me. Should we not give something similar to them? Should we not give them something similar? something that cannot be taken back once given. What is the one thing in this world, if once given, that can never be taken back from someone? It is, it is the Dhamma. It is the Dhamma. The understanding that comes by giving someone the Dhamma. That's why they say, Sabadanang, Dhammadanang, Jinati. This is the only gift that you can give someone. Once given, it cannot be taken back. Every other thing in this world, from a grain of sand to the things that are the size of planets, you give them today, the following day, they can be lost. They can be taken back. They can be destroyed. They can be stolen. The fire can get it. The wind can blow it away. The water can wash it away but not the Dhamma and the understanding that comes with that. So if they have prepared to lay their lives down for us, if they have prepared, if they were prepared to give something that they could not get back had they lost it, what are we willing to give today? What do you think they deserve today? Of course. That is why today is special for me. Because today I feel, and I'm not suggesting for one moment that this is the only place where, where this happens in the land. Right? There, I'm sure there are plenty of other places they do this. But I feel this is the only gift that really matters at the end of the day. Because I feel this is the only fitting gift for what they have given, what they have sacrificed. And guess what? We are all here for that today. You know, they say, for the sacrifices of mother and a father, make for you, even if you keep them on either shoulder and look after them for a hundred years. Clean them, feed them, wash them, right? and do every of their, each and every one of their chores. For a hundred years, you still have not paid the debt that you owe them. Parents are very special in that way. Are you suggesting for one moment that they went to lay their lives down on the line for us because of the paycheck that would come at the end of the month? Why did your mother feed you? For the paycheck that she got at the end of the month? I'm inviting you to spot the similarities. Yes, there are, there are a world of differences. I get that. I'm not suggesting for one moment that a mother and a, and, and a war veteran or a father and someone who's fought a war on our behalf are the same because one is very special. You can't, there's nothing at the equal of a mother or a father. According to the Dhamma, they are very special, very two, two very special human beings. They are none quite like the same. But if you think about it, they did, they did not do that for the paycheck. Now, there are many among you who are probably old enough to have lived in the time where, you know, the war was pretty bad. Perhaps like the Anagarika Mahatmi who gave that talk the other day, Maybe you might have, have, have had close shaves. Perhaps you, were just, you just felt lucky that day, but you only knew it after the fact. Perhaps every day you set out and you counted your lucky stars and you thought to yourself, please not today, 
please not today. Perhaps there were, a time, there were times where you got, waited in the queue and a bus pulled up, and as you got onto the bus, all you could do was hope and pray and wish, oh, please not today. Maybe as you got into the bus, you just chanted, Itipiso Bhagavad Arahang, because that is all you knew. But there was someone who was prepared to get onto that bus. Suited, yes, with their vests on, yes, but of course, you know, all of those things cannot save a life. If they get into the wrong one, and if there's a, there's a, there's a weapon there, or if there's a bomb that's about to blow off, how many of our soldiers have lost their lives in that way? Now, this is not just in our country. I mean, wherever. If someone's willing to give up something that they cannot get back once lost, I believe the only tribute that is fitting, and that is not once again suggesting that they should not be given the other things. There is no, there's, you know, that is a priceless sacrifice. So there is no limit to how much we can give to them to, to pay the debts that we owe them. But what I'm saying is, no matter what material things we give them, it is just not enough. It's not enough. So the only thing that we can give them that I feel really amounts to paying that debt off is something that we can give them that they can never lose again. Last night, several of the soldiers and the other personnel, they arrived at the monastery and they are the ones who set up the place and did all the decoration work. So you'll see in a moment once you get to go over to the other side. So they decorated the, the Dhamma Hall and the, and the path leading up, so you, where you'll be walking today in the procession. So with the help of our Anagarika Mahathyas, and with the help of our Swami Nuhansais, right, they, they arrived in the morning actually, they arrived in the morning, and they took part in all those things because they wanted to earn merits. In fact, they were due to arrive in the afternoon, and then we spoke to them and we said, you know, if you could come in a bit earlier, then we can do a few more interesting things in the evening. We are prepared to sit down with you and talk with you. Our monks are prepared to come and talk to you and help you to work out your problems, your grievances, maybe your sorrows, your fears. Perhaps to try and explain to you how you can save yourself from the inevitable that's going to happen to you. You know, let's not be, let's, let's not, Let's not fool ourselves, ladies and gentlemen. You know, these are not, they're not idiots. Right? They've read the books. They've been to Dhamma school. They've done Buddhism at the very least at school. So they know that what you give is what you get. They know that if you take a life, a life will be taken. At least they will have heard the Jataka stories. So don't you think that when they go to bed at night, it never crosses their mind? What if? When they hear stories of, of the likes of Kosala Mallika, hmm? who'd given an arms round, uh, who'd, who'd done an arms giving, which was unequaled and unparalleled arms giving, and yet, at the moment of her passing away, she was reminded of a sin that she had committed, and as a result of that, she was born in the hills. So if, if, if a soldier hears such a story, don't you think at least, at least once it's going to cross their mind wondering, good Lord, the many times I've had to pull the trigger, and the many lives that I've had to pull da put down, what if I'm reminded of that when I die? See, the deed has been done and that cannot be undone. Now, they're destitute. In the times of wars, people go looking for asylum, don't they? And even when the, the war was quite big down here, many people went looking for asylum in other countries. When the war ends, there are still people who need asylum. Don't you think so? After the war has come to an end, there are yet others who need asylum. 
And who are they? Of course, they are the soldiers. They are the people who had to give the command. You don't need to be the one who pulled the trigger. You don't need to be the one who pulled the trigger. You can be the one who stood, stood by them and said, pull the trigger, and the command was given. You can be the one who imported the weapons, because they were done with the intention of taking a life. We must be responsible for our intentions. We can only be responsible for our intentions, but we must be responsible for our intentions. We can't be responsible for anything else besides our intentions. This is something we always tell our people. Sometimes we intend to do the best of things, but sometimes the outcome of that activity, that process can, can be an unexpected one. Right? Perhaps let's say, you know, this is a life-saving something. It, it, this, is, this saves lives. Right? And I see the lady over there and I think that, you know, this could help her. And I throw this at her and it hits her on the forehead and she dies. What was my intention? To give her something that was a lifesaver. But what happened in the end? She lost her life. I can only be responsible for my intentions. Nothing bad will come to me as a result of that action. Because the outcome was determined by Vipaka. Please understand this. The outcome was determined by the Vipaka. Who's Vipaka? The Vipaka that belongs to that mind. But the intention was mine. If my intention was to take a life, then I would have taken ownership of that Vipaka myself, and then what she has expended, I will have earned. That's the way it works. Because as a life is lost, you are expending a particular Vipaka. Not, not just one Vipaka, maybe a bunch of Vipakas. A Vipaka that was generated as a karma of taking a life, you expend when, you, when your life is lost. Yeah? But if someone there decided that it was I or it was they who wanted to take that life, now the Vipaka as it's being expended becomes the ownership or gets into the ownership of another person who decides to take that life. So, the, ultimately the Vipaka just transfers from one person to another. <laughs> it's like a transaction. It just transfers from one person to, the another, to another. And, and this is why there are no winners in the war. Vipaka just transfers from one to another. Remember, Vipaka is just energy. And who does energy belong to? Energy doesn't belong to anyone because energy is universal. It belongs to the universe. So how can you ever have a winner in a war? If I'm in the battlefield today, ladies and gentlemen, and I fight this gentleman, If I stab him in the back with a weapon that I have in my hand, yes, of course, a vipaka is expended. That vipaka, at this present moment, belongs to this gentleman. But at the moment of me doing that, it's like transferring a title deed. The vipaka transfers over to me. And now who is going to get the next stabbing? I'm going to get the next stabbing. So have I really won? Have I really won? Has the world won? Has the universe won? No, because there is no way the universe can win because the bad deed, the black energy perceives, it endures. It's still there. It's simply transferred from one pair of hands to another, that's all. This is why the only way to actually win a war, as the Buddha says, nahi vere na vera ni. The only way to win a war is to give up the war inside, give up the war within. People fight because they fear, they're afraid. Of course, when you have a self, you have to be afraid. Because when a mind senses a self, there is nothing more important to that mind than the preservation of that self. So it has to fight. It has to wage war. 
It has to go into battle. You know, we, we've done this even at, even at home. When you fought your, with your little brother, when you fought with your sister, over something, something insignificant, something minor, that was still war. That was war in the way that you knew it. Perhaps you didn't have a weapon, perhaps you didn't have a firearm, but that was war nonetheless. But then as people grow up, they realize that just taking something that belongs to someone is not enough. You've got to make sure that they don't come back for it. Yes? <laughs> just taking something that belongs to someone is not enough, because that is theft. Right? But thieving is not enough, because what if they come back for it? So you can't just stop at taking what belongs to them. You have to take their lives as well, so that you're, you can be rest assured, <laughs> rest assured, that they don't come back for it. I see a very ugly side to war that perhaps leaders of countries don't see. You know, if anyone knew the real consequences of war, they would never go to war. And I don't mean the lost lives. I don't mean the destruction to property. I don't mean that. Even if one would take a selfish perspective, particularly a selfish perspective, no one would go to war. At least if they considered the consequences that would come to me as a result of that, they wouldn't go to war. They would look for alternative solutions. But I know it is not my place to make the rules because that's the way the world works. That's the thing, you know, without changing a drushti, you can't fix the world. Because the world is ultimately run by minds, aren't they? Or oh, isn't it? It's the minds that run the world. And minds are run by what? Drushti. Minds are run by drushti. It is your drushti that is in execution. That is what a mind is. When a drushti goes into execution, that is what we call a mind. So it is Drushti that rule the world, not the kings and emperors, not the oligarchs, not the businessmen that rule the world. It is Drushti that rule the world. And the thing about Drushti is they can be influenced. Your Drushti can, about something can be changed just like that. That's how something you like today can be something you don't like the following day. Or something you did, never thought about, something you never knew about, today you like, you want, you want to have it. See? All can change in, the, in a matter of a second. That's how fragile this whole system is. That is why this whole thing is so unpredictable. It's so fragile. The whole world can change in, 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 at the bat of an eyelid, at the drop of a hat. The whole world can change because all it requires is the change of a drishti. But that's the way it is. There's nothing we, we, we can do about it, and that's, there's nothing we need to do about it. It is also to our advantage, though, because all that is required to change this, not the whole world, but the whole world to one person, is a drishti. And that is why today we have organized this event. Every event that we organize at this monastery, we think about it very carefully, not about how we do it, but why we do it first. It matters not whether we organize it. What's more important to us is not the what we do. What's more important is how we do it, or rather, why we do it, sorry. Why we do something is very much more important than how we do it. Because the how will come later. As long as the why we do it is right, then the how we do it and the what we have to do, all that can come later. And this is why we are doing this today. But I feel we are only addressing half the problem. What about the other side? The other party? You know, sometimes we say, now, when we do a merit transfer, we talk about transferring merits to friends and foe. Who are the foe? Who is a foe? Who is a friend? In this, in, you know, in absolute terms, there are no friends and there are no foe. There are simply minds that have drushti. Sometimes, you know, many, at least a few of our soldiers might have done, might have died in a, in a friendly fire. 
Right? They didn't know who they were shooting at. They just had a gun, they pulled the trigger and the next morning you realize that you've, lo you've, you've shot your, your, own, your own side. So, who was the friend, who was the foe? You, you can't tell. As long as you had an intention to pull a trigger, see that's the thing, right? If you had an intention to take a life and you pull the trigger and you think you're shooting your enemy, but you're shooting your friend, is that not, is that not murder? Is that not killing? It is. Because if your intention was to kill, it matters not who is there on the other side. If your intention, even if it is to kill an animal, right? But on the other side is a, is a, is a human being. After all, a human being is also an animal. If you know that there's an animal on the other side and you want to kill it, and you pull the trigger or you shoot an arrow, it matters not whether the subject of your acti activity was actually what you thought it was. Because that is all down to Ipaka. So friendly fires could have destroyed many lives. I'm not saying a lot, but many lives, it can happen. So who's the friend, who's the foe? If I ask you the question, you have to have a clear answer. Who's the foe? Was it the LTTE? Who's the foe then? Is it Russia or is it Ukraine? <laughs> who's the foe? Yes, ignorance is the foe. Attachment is the foe. There are no other foes. There are no other enemies in this world. <laughs> the other day I was, I saw one of our Anagarika Pudas, 13 or something. He was running as fast as his legs could carry him. He'd, he'd walk me back to the kuti after I'd done a sermon sometime in the evening. And he was running as fast as his little legs could carry him. And, I, and then I said, hey, put up, come back. So he came back and I said, why are you running? I'm afraid of the dark. <laughs> I said, what? I'm afraid of the dark. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> so I said, okay. I said, I'm going to ask you a question, Buddha. Tell me one bad thing that darkness has done to you. Give me one example of some evil that darkness has done to you. Darkness, because that is what you're afraid of, right? The dark. So give me one example of something that the darkness has done to you. So he starts to think. But there's Bhutheo. <sighs> there are spirits. There are ghosts. I said, okay, okay. Tell me one bad thing that a ghost has done to you. <laughs> what harm has a ghost done to you? I asked the question again. And again he scratches his head and says, no, they haven't done anything bad to you. So why are you scared of them? <laughs> So then he began to think. He had no answer to give. So if you are scared of the dark because you are scared of ghosts, right? then there has to be something evil, something, something harmful, some harm that a ghost must have done to you, right? Have you even seen one, I asked him. <laughs> Let alone have a ghost do something. You have even seen one. No, not seen any ghosts. Then what are you scared of? If you haven't seen them, what if you are running towards them? <laughs> Huh? <laughs> because if you can't see them, you don't know where they are. So what if you're running in the wrong direction? Maybe you're running towards one. But what harm has a ghost ever done to you? No, they've not done any harm to me. So if you're afraid of the dark because you're afraid of ghosts, and ghosts have done, have done no harm to you, why are you afraid of the dark? He said, good point, Swami <laughs> I said, like, I know. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> So then he was about to turn around and walk away and say, oh, wait, 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 we haven't concluded our conversation yet. Buddha, what do you think about Raga? Hmm? What do you think about desire? When you see it, do you run away from it? Not yet, he says. Can you name one good thing that desire has done to you? Name one good thing that aversion has done to you. You can't name one bad thing that a ghost has done to you. You can't name one bad thing that darkness has done to you. Okay, now name one thing that desire has done. Name one good thing that desire has done to you. 
No, Swami Nasa. Name one good thing that aversion has done to you. No, Swami Nasa. Name one thing that uh, one good thing that delusion has done to you. No, Swami Nasa. So then, what should be, you be running away from? The darkness, or Raga Desha and more? In fact, Puta, I told him, when you are in the dark, it is not darkness that bothers you. See, I am not scared, I said. You ask me to go anywhere in the middle of the night, I am not scared, I can go. But why are you scared? What's the difference between you and I? Is it the darkness? Because that is not in, inside you or I. It's not the darkness. But you have something that I don't. You have aversion. You have desire. You have delusion. I practice the Dhamma. I was also scared of the dark Buddha, but not anymore. The darkness is just as dark as it used to be when I was a kid. <laughs> it is no more or less darker. It's just as dark. So I don't fear the dark. I don't fear ghosts. In fact, I said, if you ever bump into a ghost, if you ever do bump into a ghost, I'd ask them, what are you doing? The Buddha's era. Where are you going? Come with me and, and observe precepts. Come with me and take sil. Come with me and listen to the Dhamma. And if a ghost tries to scare you, remember that it is hurt people who hurt people. Have compassion towards them. Because they're so scared that they think to keep themselves happy, they have to scare someone else off. Understand this, Buddha. So I didn't try to convince him that there are no such things called ghosts. Because then it would simply be my word against someone else's, wouldn't it? Because how do you convince someone that something they have never seen does not exist? Because it's still in their mind. What I wanted to do with them was, I was saying, I was saying Buddha, it's not about whether they're there or they don't, they're not there. That you can choose to think whatever you like. But even if you do bump into a ghost, have compassion towards them. Because they are also suffering from Raga, Desha and Moha. You are also suffering from Raga, Desha and Moha. So you are just as bad as the ghost. In fact, if the ghost would see you, they'd run away as well. So, what is the real enemy? Ignorance. See, that child, he was also in the middle of a war. He was in the middle of a war. His war was against the darkness, or at least he thought that was the war that he had to fight. His war was against a ghost that he'd never seen. You think people who fight in the war, they've ever seen their enemy? Just think about it for a second. <laughs> you think they've ever seen their enemy? I don't mean, not, I don't mean physically. You know, you, 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 fire from a, you fire at a submarine, of course, you've never seen the enemy. You know, you, you fire the, the missile, it destroys the submarine and people die. I don't mean physically. Today we begin to understand that we actually don't see people. We simply see colors. Actually, we don't even see colors. We see objects and in our minds we perceive colors. Right? Those dots of information we combine, we process it and then we see shapes. And these shapes combined with our views of what these shapes are, our memories of what these shapes are, then we give them identities. And with ignorance, we give them a self, a unique identity, a separation. All of that is done inside the mind, isn't it? So where, are the, where is the enemy? It's inside. If men, are women, men and women are inside, then of course an enemy must be inside. So when you pull that trigger and fire at someone, are you firing at the enemy? If you are, then which way should you point the gun? If you want to shoot your enemy, which way should you point the gun? Because where's the enemy? The enemy is within. That's why I say, war is meaningless. Fighting is meaningless. Battles are meaningless. If they involve firearms, if they involve bullets, if they involve guns, if they involve bombs, these things are meaningless. This is the only real battle, the battle that you do when you come into the Sambhadasasana. Last week I asked you the question, 
why do people come into this asana? Hmm? Why do people come into this asana? This is why people should come into this asana. To actually fight a battle that is worth fighting. That is why we have invited these men and women. Sometimes today, you know, there may be people who've lost arms and legs, they were amputated, lost limbs. Perhaps many of them will come today as well. We've invited to bring them here. Because they lost a limb on our behalf. On a, you know, on a two-dimensional level, that is what happened. On a three-dimensional level, no such thing has happened. But we don't need to go there because that's not the message that they want to hear. That, that's why we have to be careful, right? I wouldn't give this talk to them. You have to pick your audience. You are able to look at the world by piercing the veil of ignorance and you are able to look at the world through a three-dimensional lens and see the absolute truths. Therefore, I speak to you in this manner. If you all emptied the room and asked the soldiers to come and sit in here, this is not what I would be saying, not a word of this. I'd be honoring them and appreciating them for all the sacrifices they have made on our behalf. But I would not be saying, you made no sacrifice, sir. <laughs> because it would be wrong to say that. See, every mind wishes for admiration. It looks for recognition. This is a topic we've talked about in the past. Recognition, how it's very important to feel recognized. You know, when people, they, uh, they go to a foreign country. I've had friends who, when someone they know is going back to their homeland, their motherland, they generally tend, they tend to ask them to bring something for them. Something, some, some of those things are really, like, really simple things. Like, please, can you bring me uh, 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 a roll of chocolate cake from that particular bakery? Please. That's a sentimental connection that they have. Please, can you bring me some cashews? That's all I want. Please, can you bring me a chocolate of that particular brand? Had they lived in this land, in this country, they'd never have put, you know, brought it, even, even brought it home. But when they go to another country, now they want to feel connected. Look at how the mind works. They want to feel connected. So then they ask for these things. So that's why, you know, when we, I have this experience, when I used to live in another country, if we moved home and went to another town or somewhere, we'd look for a shop that would sell Sri Lankan produce, right? So the jam that you we bought from those shops somehow tasted far better than the jams that were produced in that country. <laughs> it had a Sri Lankan taste to it. <laughs> but then you look at the ingredients at the back of the bottle. <laughs> there is no Sri Lankanness that goes into that. <laughs> it's all artificial. <laughs> it has artificial sweetness. It has artificial strawberry. Nothing Sri Lankan gone into it. But the label, it says imported from Sri Lanka. <laughs> That's special. You, you got to think why a mind seeks that. You know, it's not the body that wants this. You know, it's not like somehow your, your tongue has now, you know, become so at, uh, attached to it and, you know, you just can't, it, 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 to please your palate, you have to have that particular kind of jam. No such thing. This is the mind that's playing tricks on you. Because the mind always seeks connection. Connection between entities. That's why people like to network. They want to feel connected to things. They feel that their motherland, their homeland, you know, they, they are more connected and they feel more connected to the Sri Lankan people. When I used to live in, in the UK, I felt I feel, I feel a, a huge connection. I felt like a part of me was missing. So I always wanted to rekindle that. I always want to reconnect with that missing part. So therefore, whenever there was an opportunity, I'd buy Sri Lanka. Whenever someone I knew would go back to Sri Lanka, I'd ask them to get something for me because I wanted to experience that connection. Who wanted that? It was the mind that wanted that. 
Because we'd taken pride in the fact that we were Sri Lankan. What is my nationality today? <laughs> A tricky question, isn't it? <laughs> today I have no nationality. But it depends on who you ask. Someone else asks, I'm very much Sri Lankan. Oh, I am. I'm Sri Lankan like no one else. <laughs> If the queen, if she could come back and ask me, who, which nationality, I'm British. <laughs> I'm very British. <laughs> no one could be more British than you, Madam Queen. You are, even you are not more British than I am. I'm very, I'm very British. <laughs> but I speak to this audience. What nationality am, am I? I have no nationality. Because I am not an I to have a nationality. But in those chittas, right, in, not in those times, because there's no such thing besides the creation of the mind. In those chittas where you feel you are a particular individual of a particular nationality, of a particular descent, now to flourish in that moment, to fully experience that moment, you want something that helps you connect with that. That's what they talk about when they say, you want to go back to your roots. You want to connect with your roots. And that's what they talk about. That's why a friend, when they ring you, from Sri Lanka, and you are in another country, it, it gives you so much more delight than perhaps, you know, someone who is just, who you see every other day. It's that special connection. So, I'm talking about the point of admiration, I'm talking about the point of recognition. People need this. I'll let you in on a secret. Partly that's what we are doing today. But don't tell them that. I want us to know what we're doing and understand the Dhamma through that. Otherwise, we've just done a lot of merits and we've done no kusal out of it, right? You know, we are very different. Exclusively for aspirants of Nibbana. That's what we are about. We want those soldiers to feel recognized. We want them to feel appreciated. So when Guru Hamdra talks to them today and you will be there, listen to what he says. And ask yourself this question, as you enjoy everything he says and, you know, all the flowery words that he's going to use and, you know, all that good stuff he's going to be in. All of that is true. S ask yourself the question, that's true on a two-dimensional level. But on a three-dimensional level, nothing could be further from the truth. But then ask yourself why he's doing that. And then you will see boundless compassion. See, before a mother feeds a child food or rice, she has to first give the child. Before, you, she, before she feeds her child milk rice, first she has to feed the child milk. The rice will come later. You have to first feed the child with a bottle. You have come a long way from that. Today you have shed off your uniforms. Today you have taken on the uniform of the sasana. Today you stand pride, or proud rather, because today you wear the prayer mat and you consider yourself a Buddha Putra or a Buddha Dhyani. Today you don't feel that you are Sri Lankan even maybe. You don't feel like you belong to a particular nationality. But our soldiers who will be coming in today, they'll be very proud of the fact that they are Sri Lankan. And they fought to save Mother Lanka. You have to appreciate that. First, you have to appreciate that. Before you start talking to them about the fact that there is no such thing. What is Sri Lanka? Under the waters, it's all one mass, one land mass. Every bit of land is connected to the rest of it, right? Because on one side you have Sri Lanka, on the other side of the globe, you may have the Bahamas. It's all like an apple. Take an apple and eat it from, you know, around. And then you have the core. That if you just be, eat it from, you know, from, from sides, different parts of it, you have the apple left and they're all connected. It's because we have the oceans, we don't see how each land is connected to the other. And then they have drawn political borders. And then on a map, they color it a different color. So the moment you put it a different color, you feel like we are different countries. So the Pakistanians feel that they're Pakistanians and the Indians feel they're Indians. 
is because there's a, there's, a, there's a virtual line that has been drawn and into the, each of their minds they have put in the, uh, this, this sense of identity. This separation is all mental. So there was a time where people who lived in the northern part of the country said that we are from the north of the country, you are from south of the country. Even to this day people say, you know, we are from up country, you are down country. <laughs> hmm? We are the Candians. People say, you are from south, you are from the south, we are from the north. What is south and north? If you turn the world upside down, now where is the south and north? <laughs> These are all creations of the mind. It's okay if people actually understood that, because, but because people don't understand this, they don't understand the absolute reality here, they identify themselves by the conventional separations that we have created. To rule the land, of course, you need boundaries. That is to rule the land. Right? So if they, if they build a hospital, then they must check, you know, if there are hospital, other hospitals in the vicinity. To, to, to rule a population, you need to have a leader, right? a provincial leader, a village leader. You need to have people like that. This is, for, this is to, to, to ensure, to sustain a race, a population, a country, and so on. But ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, you know, you know the elephant that lives in Yala, do you think he knows he lives in Yala? If you pick the elephant up and go and put him in Dehivala, does the elephant know that now all of a sudden he's been moved to Dehivala? He doesn't know this. It will know that the environment is different, but it's, no longer going to, it's not going to identify itself as an animal that's living in a zoo. Because it didn't identify itself as an animal that lived in a, a, national, uh, a natural reserve. Because it cannot take on the drushti. That's why. That's the only difference. You can't give it the drushti that you are now. See, if you, if you put an elephant onto a plane and take it to Australia and then leave it, let it loose. Now the, Australia, the, the, the elephant, even after having lived there for the next 20, 30 years, it's not going to identify itself as an Australian. But don't you know people who've gone for two days and they say they're Australian? They even pick up an accent. Two days. Just think about how these things work. Hello, how are you? Is what they say before they go, but when they come in, or am I? <laughs> That's how they speak. Two days. Where is all that coming from? All in the mind. All comes from drushti. Because the mind wishes to identify it as a self. Separate. I'm Australian. I'm British. I'm Indian. I'm Pakistan. I'm, I'm Sri Lankan. Hmm? I'm a Jafnian. I'm a Candian. I'm a Kurunagalian. <laughs> These are all separations because the mind thrives in that. But what the mind doesn't know is that each time it does that, all it does is it creates for itself suffering. Ultimately, there is no such thing called separation and just that. There's always going to be separation and there's always going to be the 11 great fires. It comes as one package. It always comes as one package. You know, whenever you separate something, ladies and gentlemen, when it disperses, you feel like it's dying. When, when, it, when, you, when, you, when you consider something as an aggregate, you see it disperse, but when you consider something to be an entity, now it decays, now it dies. Now when it is taken away from you and you feel you are one and you feel that is another, now you see a distance between two objects, don't you? Now you have Piyahivi Piyogodukko. That is how it works. See, if this pen identifies itself as a self, if this pen identifies itself as a self, now the moment, when this pen looks at this one, it thinks I am one and this is another. Now when you take these two things apart, away from each other, now it thinks Piyahivi Piyogodukko. That's because this is, an, this is a, a, an entity, this is also an entity, right? And this feels, if this could perceive entities, then it's going to sense that one entity is moving away from me. Now replace it with another entity that this actually likes because they're the same. Now, 
coming together with your loved ones. If this starts walking away, apyehi, if, 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 it, if it doesn't like this, for instance, apyehi zampa yoga dukkho, and then piehi vipa yoga dukkho, see? All in the mind. But no such thing is happening because all this is matter, energy. If I keep this so close to each other, what's either side of this pen? Energy. If I move this away, now what's in this gap? Nothing. It's still energy. Well, if I move it further away, what's here? It's still energy. So when is the time where this pen is never or away from energy? It never is. It's always surrounded by energy. So where is this sense of piyehi vipayogo or piyehi sampayogo? It doesn't exist in reality. These are all creations of the mind. Because the mind experiences itself as an entity, now it has dealings with other entities. They don't exist out there, they exist in the mind. So today you will see officers. You will see some officers saluting other officers. Look at it and study what's really going on there. You know, today you'll see all sorts. This is going to be a lab today. <laughs> this is a fabulous laboratory today. Normally you see Swami Nuhansi's Anagarikas, Anagarikas, Shravakas, Shravikas, and Vaisis, right? But today you'll see, you'll, see a, you'll see a lot going on out there. You'll, you'll hear Guru Handro giving a talk, right? In those words, try and read between the lines and see why he's saying that. You will, you will recognize, Guru Handro can't actually be meaning this. How is Guru Hamdro saying that you sacrificed yourself for this country? When he knows that there is no one to sacrifice. When he knows that there is no such thing called a country. These are all creations of the mind. Why is he saying something like this? That's because first you have to give the child the bottle. First you have to give the child the bottle. Take a moment and think about how fortunate you are. You may not get driven around in a defender. You may not be driven around, you know, with a, with a what do you call them, a squad. Hmm? You may not have people standing up as you walk into a room. You may not have people saluting you. You may not have a uniform. But you've understood the truth, haven't you? What's the price for that? <laughs> See, when you have the priceless, everything else in this universe, becomes insignificant. You have been gifted with the priceless. That is what they deserve. Each and every man that walks through those gates. Because they were willing to sacrifice their lives on our behalf. Today we have what we have because they were prepared to go the extra mile. They were prepared to pick up a weapon when there were monks in the temples, there were people who had observed sil. And they had promised themselves, never will I pick up a, a weapon. And they were in the temples observing sil. But there was a soldier who picked up a weapon and said, so that they can be there, I'll go and kill. Yeah. Three-dimensionally, makes no sense. But two-dimensionally, makes all the sense in the world. But if you can speak to them, talk to them, talk to them endearingly, Show them that we care. Show them that we appreciate what they have done for us. Then they'll come back tomorrow. Today they may have come for recognition. Hmm? Today they might have come for recognition. That's why they're in uniform. We invited them, we asked them to come in uniform. So they have come in uniform. Tomorrow, they'll come clad in white. Tomorrow they'll come and ask, because now they're happy. They've been fed with the bottle. Now they've had the milk, now they're coming for the rice. Then we can sit them, sit them down with us. Then we can start talking to them about the absolute truths that they have never seen. Some of the most senior officials, when they speak to us, they tell us. So I was saying last night, after they'd done all the decoration work, I got carried away. Last night, after they, in the morning, they came here around 8 o'clock in the morning and they were doing, setting up the whole place, setting up the Dhamma Hall, preparing for today's proceedings. 
And then after around two o'clock, they said, Swaminathan said, you said you wanted to help us, so we'll come in the morning, we'll do all the work then, and then after, in the afternoon, please sit down with us and share with us the, the Dhamma. So that is what we did. Last night, several of our Swaminathan they came down and they sat down with them individually and talked with them. And they said, sir, tell me, what's on your mind? What are the things that bother you? Do you still have those sleepless nights? Do you still hear those screams at night? Do you still hear the rifles, the weapons going off? Are you still awakened by nightmares? What bothers you? Does the demon of desire get you? So we were showing them individually that the battle is yet to begin. They gave us our freedom. Now it's time to give them this. It's time to give them this. I want you all to take part in that. That is why you're here. You know, as today, you'll be walking down in the procession, you know, they'll be holding, they'll be holding Mutukuda for you. They will look at you and they'll be very impressed by who you are, what you do, right? the way you conduct yourselves, in the way you greet them, in the way you smile with them. They'll be so utterly impressed and I want you to be like that so that they come back tomorrow without the uniform. Just as you have come today. As you walk with them, give them a smile, a warm, welcoming smile. Make them feel like this is home for them, a second home. Show them love that they've never seen before. Show them an affection that they've never felt before. Pretty much everyone who walks through those gates, they always say this, when we come into this place, Swaminas, we feel something that we've never felt anywhere before. What is it, they ask us. Frankly, I don't know either. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it's there. It's in the air. I don't know what it is. I can imagine what it must be. It's all of us. This is what I believe is compassion. This is what I believe is loving kindness. It makes a change in the environment. Maybe Maybe around this perimeter, it's one or two degrees cooler than it is outside. I don't know, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just making stuff up. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But it's cooler one way or the other. Maybe the air isn't cooler. Maybe it's just as warm, maybe even warmer, because there's a <laughs> large number of people here breathing the air and heating up the environment. But it's cooler another way. We are cool at heart. Let them experience that. You know, when, when, when a person smiles, we as highly, we as individuals and beings who are highly attuned to pick up body language, right? Human beings are able to tell when a man smiles, why he's smiling. He may not be able to express it in words, but there's an instinct within each and every one of us. So when it's a vulgar smile, you know it's one. Hmm? Now you know that's an invitation. <laughs> you know it. When it's a smirk, you know it's one. When it's to mock you, you know it's to mock. When it's to appreciate, you know it is to appreciate. When it's a, when it's a smile that is brimming with lo loving kindness and compassion, you can tell. You can tell. Because we have this instinct within us. We are very social animals. So we resonate with the beat of another heart. It's, 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 it's within us. It's kind of like in our DNA. We've adapted ourselves to, to, to coexist with each other and that's how things work. So when you smile, I invite you to smile with them because I know that you'll always smile the way I want you to smile. I know as you smile, they will see within your hearts something golden. Make them feel at home. Make them feel like, finally, they have found paradise. Because now they need asylum. So today, 
asylum seekers have come here. They are our heroes. Yes. Now it's your turn to be their heroes. The Swami Nuhansas alone cannot do this. We never did anything alone, alone. You know that. When we first came here, the ten of us, right? If you weren't there on that day, we'd have to walk out of this place. You were there. When they walked in with arms, you had none in yours. You welcomed even those who came walking with arms. Not arms, food. Weapons. Knives and machetes. And you welcomed them. You said, come home. <laughs> This is also home for Uncle Imara. Do come in, take a seat. Would you like something to eat? <laughs> Besides my head? <laughs> e enjoy being who you are today, is what I'm saying. Like I said, I have very little time to talk to you today, but enjoy who you are today. Let the world see who you are, because these people deserve the best of you. They deserve to see the best side of you. So do wear that smile on your face. And always be... Have that boundless compassion and loving kindness. Look at them and look at their story. The story that, you, that they won't tell you. It is not written on their uniform. Right? It's not. They may have a scar on their face. But the scar won't tell you everything. But you know the story. Among them may even be siblings of our fallen heroes. Among them may be children of our fallen heroes. Officers, perhaps some who had never seen the battlefield, but they were still there, they were still making sacrifices. Like what? Shoot. You know that's a sacrifice? Because no one asked me to make that decision. Just imagine if someone came and asked me, Swami Nan, sir, there are people here, they want to burn this monastery down. What should we do? They said, please talk to them and, and explain to them that, you know, this is not the place to be doing it and they're going to go, do themselves great harm. We've tried talking to them, Swami Nan, sir, they're not negotiating with us. They're not willing to negotiate. All they want to do is burn this place down. What should we do? Shall we hit them? Hmm? Shall we beat them? I said, don't ask me. <laughs> don't ask me. I can't answer that question. I am willing to walk away, but there are other people who are here who need this place. So don't ask me that question, ask someone else, because I can't answer. I've, I've expired myself by giving you all the answers. I'm exhausted. I've given all the answers I can. Negotiate, talk to them, teach, preach to them, teach them, do whatever you can. Give them some food, give them some water. Have you tried any of those things? Yes, we've tried all that, but they, all they want to do is burn down this place. What do we do? You know, even if I said, call the police, what am I really saying? Don't ask me, tell the police. <laughs> now what's the police have to, going to have to do when they come here? <sighs> what's, what is the police going to have to do when they come, come here? Are they going to come here with Piritnu? <laughs> That's why we transfer marriage to them every day. They're not going to come here and sprinkle some holy water, are they? So basically what I'm saying is, don't put me on the line, save me. Please someone else make the decision if it's your place to make it. But whenever someone steps in to make that decision, they're acquiring karma. Is that selfish of me? Some might say, yes, it is very selfish of you, Swami So how come you don't go and do that and you get them to do your dirty work for you? Here's what I have to say. Inform the police. Let them come and talk to them. I'll talk to the police. Because at least I can talk to them, I can explain to them. And even after everything is said and done, I can still talk to them and save them. Like I said, you know, these members of the armed forces, even to this day, they may have sleepless nights and whenever, you know, once they start listening to the Dhamma folks, <laughs> hmm? just imagine, <laughs> you listen to the four great health stories, right? 
once they start listening to that, they might even wet their pants. But then someone must be there to surround them and embrace them and tell them, no, it's okay, there's an answer. This is as bad as it can be, but don't you worry, there's an answer. There's a solution to this problem. But as they say, I was going to say, some of the most senior officials, a story that they had shared with our Swami Nuances and they, one had said to Guru Handru as well, they've traveled to many religious places, but hardly anywhere have, has anyone ever told them that if you kill, you will be killed. Violence begets violence. Hatred begets hatred. If you have harmed someone else, it matters not why you have harmed them. You know, if you throw a rock at a snake that's about to get your child, is that not a, is that, is that not a sin? You want to save your child and there's a snake coming to get your child you, or, or a mad dog. It, and the dog is mad as well. It's a mad dog. Right? You throw something at the dog to save your child. Is that not a sin? Saving the child is meritorious. Very little merit in that because you are doing it selfishly. Because it's your child after all. You're not doing it to save an arahant. Right? You're saving your child. Your child it comes with lobe. So therefore, that meritorious deed, then the merit you get out of that is almost next to none. I'm not going to say zero, next to none. But you attack the dog. And that was done with full hatred. Anger. And the demerit that comes out of that, you've saved your son, but you've earned the demerit. And now that's going to come back to you one day. You can't rationalize things like that. <clears throat> what is good is good, what is bad is bad. They don't cancel each other out. You know, these fallen heroes, they might have sacrificed their lives to save the temples of our country. Maybe they saved the mosques, maybe they saved the churches, maybe they saved the kovils, maybe they saved the clergy. They saved mothers, they saved fathers, they saved sisters, brothers and sons and daughters. They did. No question about that. They saved teachers, they saved doctors, they saved nurses. They saved pretty much everyone. But unfortunately, it matters not why they killed. Because at the moment you kill, it's a kill. It matters not why they've taken a life. For what they have saved, they have earned merits. But for what they have taken, they have earned demerits. Now we have to save them. We can save them for as long as they're alive. Because once their eyes shut, that's it. Now they're like a leaf falling from a tree. Wherever the wind blows it, the leaf will be blown. Before that we have to save them. That's why we can, whatever we can do for them, whatever tribute we can offer them, ladies and gentlemen, we can only do that while they're still alive. These were the men and women who were saved at the end of the war. Many hundreds of thousands, too late. And why is it that a war can never end? Because remember, if I throw something at you to strike you dead, I have already committed a sin. I have already committed a deed. The vipaka for that is now stored in my vipaka skanda, in my karmic strands. It's now there. See, these are the seeds for another war, isn't it? Those who got killed, weren't they killed because they had killed? Answer. Those whose lives were taken, were they, weren't their lives taken because they had taken lives? Those who, whose children were lost to the war, was that not because they had taken someone else's child? Isn't that how the dharma, adhikarna works? That's not how the law of the land works, but that's how the law of dharma works. It's God, after all. What you've given, you get given. What you've denied, you are denied. That's how it works. It's very fair. Fair and square. Very fair. You can't ask for a more fair system than that. Can you? If I had to suffer for the bad deeds that this lady had done, do you think that's fair? If she had to suffer for the bad deeds that I had done, is that fair, madam? Of course not. So what's the only fair system? You are responsible for your own intentions. 
It can't get fairer than that, can it? Well, the deeds have been done. Now, now we have our work cut out. We have our work cut out for us. We have to save them. So, as you wish to save your own children, mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters, as you wish to save your own brother, as you would wish to save your own sister, because it is they who these people have saved. They have given you your mothers and fathers, they have given you your children, they have given you, they have saved you, your brothers and sisters. Now it is time to give them what they have given you. If it is because of them today you are still with a mother, then you have to give them mother. If it is because of them you are still with your father, your father is still alive, your brother and your sister are still alive and they are with you, remember they have given you a brother. So now it is time for you to be a brother to them. Do this with all your heart, as we will all be doing. I want all of you to take, get involved in this, get, in, get involved in this personally. Not because the other person is getting involved. Not because the person in front of you is involved or the person behind you is involved. Get involved in this personally. Put your heart and soul into this. There's nothing to be lost because this is the only fight that, only battle that is worth fighting. I ask you to do this because tomorrow they will come in here without the uniform. They will. They will. I promise you, they will. You have come without your uniforms. <laughs> Where are those uniforms that you used to come in with? You shed those uniforms today. Today you, fear, you wear the uniform of the sasana. They will come in with those uniforms. You know, these are young men and women. Hmm? They have their whole life in front of them, ahead of them. As you look at them, imagine them in a robe. I do that. We have asked even, uh, we have asked them to bring in some ladies of the armed forces. Because we want our Anagarika Mahatmyas to have their way with them. <laughs> Because when they start talking, you can't get them to stop. <laughs> They're just like you. <laughs> Your daughters, well, no wonder. <laughs> so you've asked them to bring them in as well. Because today is our day to serve. They served us and today we shall serve them. We shall give them something that cannot be taken away from them. Our country owes them a debt. Hmm? The state owes them a debt. The politicians owe them a debt. The children of this nation owe them a debt. The adults of this nation owe them a debt. And they will repay those debts as best as they can. The businessmen, they owe them a debt. And they'll repay that debt as best as they can. We, in the sasana, owe them a debt. And boy, oh boy, we will repay our debts in a way that they can never lose it. So as you walk in the Parahara, stand with pride and know that they are watching you. So walk in lockstep so that they'll be impressed. One foot after the other. Whatever you can, whatever you can, even that little deed is tremendously meritorious. Because you do it out of compassion. You know, one of the first things, I don't know whether Guru Hamra mentioned this, one of the first things that the chief of staff had observed, so he's going to be the chief guest today, chief of staff of the, of the, of the tri forces. One of the first things that he, was, he had observed and been impressed by was how our monks, our anagarikas, our anagarikas, they all walk in lockstep. That was the first thing he had mentioned to Guru Hamdra when, when he had a moment to talk with him. He said, Swami Nuhansa, I've only seen this in the forces. Do you beat them up? <laughs> Is it the baton treatment you use? No, we don't. So why do you do it? Because of this. You are impressed now, aren't you? Hmm? You are impressed now, sir, aren't you? You are impressed enough to come back to the sasana. 
You were impressed to get on your knees and worship those monks. Do you realize how much merit you own as a result of that? You earn as a result of that? You're impressed enough to bring your staff here today. That's why we walk in lockstep. So that you can give the first sadhukara to the sasana. That's why we do it. Otherwise, well, you know, why does it matter how we walk? As long as we get from A to B, yeah? why do we need to walk in lockstep? You just walk. But there are those who are impressed by that. Not in us as individuals, they are impressed in the sasana. Because that requires a great deal of discipline. That is why they are impressed. And they know how difficult it is to, to, to put discipline into, into the minds of young people. And normally you've got to beat them up. You've got to give them punishments. But we don't do any of that here. We just tell them why we do it. Remember, I said at the beginning, it's not the what that is more important, the why is more important than that. When you explain to these, young, these minds, including all of you, why we do something, if you believe in that cause, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be willing to go any distance. We just need to understand our will. Because if you know your will, there will be a way. That's what we're always doing in the sermons. That's why Guru Hamdra always asks us to behave ourselves, conduct ourselves in a way that impresses people. Impresses the, not only human beings, but devas. You will see what you will see when I, see when I do something in front of you, but the devas are watching all the time. So must I not conduct myself in a manner that even the devas feel, oh, how we wish we were born humans? <laughs> So that they could also come into the sasana. Now that is the way we conduct ourselves. In the Buddha, he himself said, when asked why, Venerable Sir, do you lay down the discipline? He said, one of the main reasons I do that is so that those who are impressed by the sasana will continue to be impressed by the sasana. Those who are unimpressed by the sasana will become impressed by the sasana. So that the next day they will come without their uniforms. That's why he laid down eight or so reasons for laying down the sasana. The longevity of the sasana was another, but these were one of the two main reasons. For those who are impressed to be further impressed and for those who are unimpressed to become impressed. And that is what happened. And today we have about 200 Two to three hundred of the armed forces will be visiting us and who will be with us. And they will witness each and every one of you. And they will engage in merits. They will listen to the Dhamma. And they will join our clan. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe in a week, maybe in the next lifetime. So what? Nibban is for all of us. Yeah? So, we must all start somewhere, someday. They started theirs the day they went onto the battlefield. And they said, we will fight so that you can go on to practice the path. And you can go on to attend your salvation. That day they started this war. Little did they know that those sacrifices will earn for them, themselves rewards in the way that we are paying them today. Take this each and every one of you personally, ladies and gentlemen, sir, madam, take this as a personal responsibility. Those men and women, they fought on behalf of our motherland. They fought on behalf of what they thought was right. In whichever way they sacrificed their lives to save another, and yours was one of them. Take this a personal responsibility to do whatever you can today. Even if it is by a simple smile, even if it is by offering them an opportunity to earn some merits, as you will get the chance to do today. Soon after, so as we are going to be, so we're going to stop this sermon in a few minutes after that. Today, they will be holding the umbrellas. So you're giving them the chance to do that today. Why? We want to repay that debt. So that they can earn some merits. Because you understand how to earn the merits without holding the umbrella in your hand. They don't know how to do that yet. They still need bottle fielding. Yeah? Because you understand that this arm doesn't belong to you. So the umbrella doesn't need to be in this arm <laughs> or in this hand, right? It can be in any hand. In fact, it doesn't even need to be in a hand. 
because shelter is what is good. So therefore you rejoice in that. Even if a banana leaf were to bend itself forward as a monk would sit, sit down to meditate, can you not rejoice in that? Who does a banana belong to? No, it doesn't need, nothing needs to belong to anybody because nothing does belong to anybody. You're just rejoicing in goodness, wholesomeness. Today you are able to do that because you have been gifted with a dhamma. So today we give them every opportunity to earn those merits. So let them walk the monks in the procession. Let them hold the umbrellas. And after they have uh, offered alms to the monks, they, will, they have also requested to offer alms to all of you as well. Let them. And hold your plate out and hold your heart out. Wish for them every good luck and every good fortune. As you hold that plate out, ladies and gentlemen, have in your mind, may all beings be well. May all sentient beings attain to Nibban. Hold it out to them. You have no idea where, as they serve that rice, that, that spoonful of rice. Remember? Half of, a merit, half of a merit is determined by my intention, the other half is determined by the recipient. Okay? The other half is determined by a recipient. When they fought the war, you might have been at home watching TV. They saved the life of someone who was watching TV. So the merit they would have earned would have been very little because although an intention was there to save, but who they saved was someone who was, a, you know, someone who had been a victim of sensual lust. But today as they're offering a spoonful of rice, you are someone who is able to spread loving kindness and compassion to the heart that stands in front of you. Have those thoughts in your mind. Do have them. This is how you are going to pay your tribute to them. So as you hold your plate out, looking down, with a smile on your face, and as they offer it to them, as they offer you the right rice, wish them, Nimanama Veva, may you attain to Nibbana. Supatveva, may you be well. Do that. Each of those words will make a difference in their hearts. They may never have heard this before. From a monk, maybe, from a devotee, to hear the words Supatveva. <laughs> To hear the words, may you attain to Nibbana, they may not have heard this before. Maybe they have, maybe they might not have. But this space is special. It's special because your hearts are special. Because you are special. Let them take that away with them. Let them take that home with them. The memories that you have left them with. May they walk back with those memories. So now is today a function just for the monks? Something for Guru Hamdru and the rest of the Swami Nahasis to do? Or the Anagarika Mahatmyas? Or the Anagarika Mahatmyas? Today is our day to pay our tribute. To give them what they deserve. Because remember, they gave something. They risked their lives. They were willing to give something up that they could never get back had they lost it. Therefore, they deserve something similar. Therefore, we must give them something that they can never lose. Are you all fair play? All game for that? Fabulous. That's the kind of people I like to associate with. My kind of people. Let's do a merit transfer and bring the sermon to a close. Okay, so first and foremost, let us remind ourselves how incredibly fortunate we are to be in receipt of the Lord Buddha's teaching and with immense gratitude towards the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, upasakas and upasikas. Let us take a moment to transfer these merits to all those who have protected the Dhamma and preserved the Dhamma and passed it down through the generations of the noble lineage in the form of the Tripitaka, which is thankfully available to us today to study, understand and comprehend the Dhamma. Let us also take a moment to transfer this message to all monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries, as well as the members of the Mahasangha present throughout the world, including the chief prelates of all of the chapters who have sacrificed their lives to protect and preserve the Sambhuta Sasana. Let us also transfer this message to my teacher, Guru Swami Nuhansi, as well as all the monks resident at the monastery and the Anagarikas and Anagarikas attached to the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer this message to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha. Be that by transliterating these talks, sharing them out with others, or inviting others to join them. May they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also transfer this message to those 
To, our, to the friends of our monastery, our devotees, who for the sake of merits to help them attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana, continue to sustain the Mahasangha. This includes everyone from those of you who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes, and medicines, as well as those who extend their know-how and continue to extend their well wishes. May they all rejoice in these merits and by the power of these merits, may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to our mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews and nieces, our friends, our acquaintances, our elders and our teachers, our employers and our employees, and those who've gone the extra mile on our behalf, everyone and anyone who've helped us, supported us and assisted us in any way, shape or form, may they all rejoice in these merits and by the power of these merits, may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to the devas and brahmas, spirits and demons, primarily the Sakadeva, as well as all the numerous gods and deities who have committed themselves to fulfill and preserve the Sambhuta Sasana, let us transfer these merits to our guardian deities who keep a watchful eye over us and keep us out of harm's way. May they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to those who have passed away in our name. Our forefathers, our ancestors, let us also transfer these merits to those members of the armed forces who sacrifice their lives as well as members of the police force who sacrificed their lives to protect the peace and harmony of our nation, as well as friends and foes who have lost their lives in the wars. Let us also transfer these merits to those who lost their lives to natural disasters and calamities such as tsunamis and earthquakes, landslides, fires, floods, pandemics, and so on, reminding ourselves that in this infinitely long journey of sansara, they will all have been mothers and fathers to us, brothers and sisters to us, sons and daughters to us, friends to us. They will have helped us, supported us, and assisted us in any way, shape, or form possible and available to them out of compassion and loving kindness and a sense of gratitude to all that they have done on our behalf. Let us take a moment to transfer all the merits we have acquired throughout Sansara to all of them. May, by the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the woeful plains, they redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plain. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And finally, may by the power and blessings of all the means we have acquired throughout the day, we be able to witness the advent of many hundreds of thousands of Arahants on this blessed land. And may you and I and everyone who's helped make this program a success become Arahat Anvahanse or an Arahat Teran Anvahanse in this very life itself and in the era of the Gautama Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May the blessings of the Noble Triple Gem be with you all. The members of the Mahasangha will now transfer their blessings to you. Raga ginnang nidatnva Desha ginnang nidatnva Moha ginnang nidatnva Nibbana parama sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva <coughs> Mamada Sialu Loka Sialu Satnvayo Nibbana param sukhayan Sukhita tara vetnva Nibbana param sukhayan Sukhita tara vetnva Nibbana param sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Raga Gini Niveva Dvesha Gini Niveva Moha Gini Niveva 
ತುನುಡುವನ್ಗೆ ಸೂಸಿ ಅನಂತ ಮಹಾಗುಣ ಬೆಲೆನ್ ಸೀಲ ಲೋಕ ಸೀಲು ಸತ್ಯೋಮ ನಿಬ್ಬಾನ ಪರಮ ಸುಖೇನ್ ಸುಖಿತ ತರವಿತ್ವ ಸಾಧು ಸಾಧು ಸಾಧು